All right, John, I am ready for a quick hit episode here with you because this is something that I am dealing with with so many clients. And it really comes down to, we talk about it all the time, the idea of like- The rant is coming. Yeah, the rant rant is coming. No, but really, I'm really hoping that people- can better understand what's going on so that at least they can get their emotions more in check. Here's the hardest part. We talk about rational side of our brain. We talk about the emotional side and emotions typically win. Mm -hmm. The elephant. The big one here is like, first off, one of our most listened to episodes as, as of recently is the episode on debt and what the wealthy do that's different than what most others do. And it really comes down to, we're talking about this idea of good debt and having good debt is actually a good thing. Now, the only way to have good debt is against assets, right? Like that's what good debt is, right? You're going to buy an asset or you have an asset and you actually leverage against that asset. The asset will continue to grow And of course, your debt, if you continue to borrow, you continue to pay interest, that is going to grow as well. But the part that people get stuck on is this idea they would rather sell things and pay tax. So they get less than what they had the day before they sold. They sell it. They pay capital gains or they pay income taxes, depending on what it is that, you know, what, what, where this money is coming from, from these investments. Ultimately, that money will just slowly dwindle away through inflation. And Mm -hmm. through spending, there is no growth there. Of course, we're not paying interest to spend our dollars. The big argument is I don't want to pay money in order to use my own money. That's like what people say, but that's actually an illogical move. And I think today we've got to highlight some of what actually impacts things like interest rates so that people can actually understand at a high level, like almost like a macroeconomic perspective as to how this all works so that they could recognize that, guess what? It doesn't actually matter what the interest rate is five, 10, 15 years from now, because mm-hmm. it's all going to be okay. Hmm. Yeah. I think, I think many people are saying like, if, okay, I have this asset and I, I, I don't want to lock up my money. I don't want to like, it's going to get in there and I'm not going to be able to touch it. And if I do, I have to borrow against it. And therefore, like, what happens if interest rates are higher? It's like, oh, now I have to borrow at a higher rate than if I just just sold it. I didn't lock it in in the first place. It's more liquid. And then Mm -hmm. I can I can spend it. But the problem, right, is is that you spend it, like you said, it it just goes away. It dwindles down. Whereas if I'm going to borrow against it, I'm, I'm so concerned about this interest rate that I now have to pay. And That's more money out of my pocket. And I think that's the hard part for people to wrap their head around it is that, okay, I have this money, it's sitting there, but now I have to pay even more money to just access it. And and I think this comes back to something that we've said a few times on different episodes about that. You you have to think about that the rate, like the, the interest rate let's say, or, or inflation, or there's a value here attached to rates. Like you have an asset, which is the amazing part. And if you have an asset, then you have this like chunk of like, let's call it money. It's sitting there, no matter what that asset is. It's like, it has an associated interest rate attached to it. I like mm. to think of it that way because either you have to borrow to access the asset without selling it, right? So if you sell it, boom, it's in your cash, it's in your pocket. Great. If you don't sell it, you have access to it, but yeah, you have to say, pay the interest rate or think of it like this. Your asset is value. It's a pot of money sitting there. And if you don't spend it, you could make money, you know, on interest by lending it out. Like Mm -hmm. there's, there is an interest rate attached to that money. Either you're earning interest or you're spending the interest. It's one way or the other, right? It's like you're, and if you do nothing, you're losing the actual interest that you could be using uh, or earning if you don't say, if you if you don't say borrow against it or, or you, you use that asset. Like basically there's an interest rate there somewhere. And if the interest rate is high, you earn the high rate. If the interest rate is high, then you have to pay the high rate. But it's like, that's why it doesn't matter. I think the way you're saying it is yeah. like your assets value is increased 
Therefore, the interest rate is increased. Like it's all, it's all coming out in the wash. It's just like you said, it's emotionally mindset about getting around this. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're getting closer to this idea that like, we need to understand that interest rates aren't random. Like they are connected. And of course, in short periods of time, they might not seem so. So for example, I'm going to use the housing market as an example. When interest rates spiked up very quickly here, starting in 2022 and onwards, what happened is, is you had this like quick change to interest rates and therefore that actually like suppressed the housing market a little bit. It almost seemed like the opposite. You're like, wait a second, interest rates went up. Now housing prices are going down. Well, Actually, what happened is, is interest rates took a longer time to catch up to what was happening to appreciation rates. So they had to quickly adjust them. So if everyone remembers from 2019 all the way to 20, end of 2021, set prices extremely jumped. Why is that? Because of this thing called inflation. Inflation was very, very high relative to what it had been doing in the years prior. And therefore, interest rates had to spike up to try to kind of mitigate that. Like we're increasing interest rates to bring the inflation rate down. When things inflate, while we hate it going to the grocery store, while we hate it when we go out to a restaurant, while we hate inflation for so many things, who loves inflation is the wealthy. The wealthy love inflation because their assets are increasing in value while they sleep. And this is the part that I think is so critical for us to understand when we're utilizing this idea of leverage strategies, be it to purchase assets or to leverage in order to generate tax-free income for ourselves. I'm going to use a house as an example. What the typical retiree does here in Canada, which is problematic, is they sell their primary residence because there's no capital gains and they downsize. This idea of downsizing is a big deal, right? Like I get it. Downsizing makes sense if you're like, the house is just too big and I don't want too big of a house. But what many people do is they go, no, we're actually going to free up equity from our house and we're going to live off of that equity because we're now retired and we need money in retirement. So they take a million dollar home, just making up numbers, and then now they buy a $500,000 home. Now, that's usually where the conversation starts. By the way, they usually go million. They want to buy 500 and then they buy 750 because yeah. they want a really nice version of the $500,000 house. And then they've kind of like have been like, oh, we're not quite there. But here's the real important part is that that let's say they went from a million dollar home to a $500,000 home. They've released $500,000 of equity. And in this case, because it's a primary residence, they've done it tax free. So that part's good. The problem is is that in each and every year ongoing, the million dollar house is going to appreciate by at least whatever the rate of inflation is, probably more though, right? As we've seen because of the Canadian housing market being so tight. So let's pretend for a second it's 4%. So that million dollar home is going to appreciate by 40,000. The $500,000 house is going to appreciate by half that amount. It's going to appreciate by 20,000. Now here's where the problem gets worse is that if we keep going, you're compounding on a bigger amount each and every year on the million dollar home that keeps growing at the same rate. The smaller home is growing at the same rate, but it's not going to ever, of course, catch up to that million dollar home. And here's the crux of it all. When that money that we freed up by cashing in the 500,000, mind you, we didn't pay realtor fees in this world. We didn't pay land transfer sure. tax. We didn't pay legals. We didn't do all, all of those things that you did oh, and all the money you put into the property before you sold it because you were trying to elevate the, the, the uh, purchase price. All of those things, we're not even factoring in here. We're gifting those to us for this discussion. That 500 is going to eventually run out. And then now they have to look back to that asset again and go, what's our move? And you know what that move for many Canadians is, is downsize further or sell completely and then move into some sort of rental situation. And guess what? They eventually get to a place where they take zero benefit, zero sort of, of advantage of this thing known as inflation because we were taught when we were very young and all throughout our working years that we should pay off debt and that we shouldn't hold debt because debt is bad and interest rates can increase. When in reality, if we use logic, you recognize that, wait a second, 
my property value is going to be increasing in the years where interest is is at a higher level. And therefore, I can leverage and be at a net better spot despite interest rates being higher because my assets are also appreciating. So this is a big, big idea that we need all of our Canadian wealth secret seekers to start accepting or at least thinking about in their minds that we're not here to over leverage. We're not here. We want to use conservative leverage and we want to keep assets for as long as we possibly can to kick the can on capital gains taxes and to create tax-free income. Because here's the problem. If we look to the taxable buckets, the result is even worse because now we're gifting much of the upside that we're trying to release through taxation and we lose the opportunity for that asset to continue growing in the later years as interest rates increase. Yeah. And I think you're right. The, bi the big idea here is wrapping our minds around here about how do we get over the emotional side of using leverage to grow your wealth? Because as soon as you get past that part, that part, that's when the, the real, Kyle used the word compounding, the real compounding will start to take effect because you're past the emotional side of fear of using the good debt to grow that wealth. Once, you know, if, if you've still got like hangups on that right now, like you've listened to this episode, you've listened to our previous episodes about how do you manage your debt and think about debt, then reach out to us. Like, you know, get on over to CanadianWealthSecrets.com, join our email list email us like we want to hear what are some of the holdbacks the barriers that you're experiencing right now that makes it feel harder for you to use leverage in the debt that you have you know have access to your assets to grow your wealth because i i want to hear about them because then well hmm. let's talk about how you can you can use that or 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 get beyond that because that's how you're going to actually grow your wealth the most